Thank you. Um, I hope you can all hear me. So, yeah, excellent. Yes. Thank you for that introduction, Martin. Um, I've practiced this talk to fit in time, so I, I'm not sure what will happen now. But uh, it's nice to be here um, virtually. Um, so I'm going to talk today about Icosphera, which is a suite of programs I'm working on to add shape to molecular machine learning and make the best use of small data sets. Uh, OK, as soon as I figure out how to advance the slide, there we go. Um, OK, so a lot of machine learners are getting very interested in chemistry. So sort of the people over in computer science are seeing chemical problems as the new next next big area for uh, machine learning to tackle, right? which is great. Um, but it, it's my belief that when we take machine learning algorithms from sort of standard areas and bring them to chemistry, we need to pay a lot of attention about how they work and some of the specific issues that chemistry has. Um, so one of the propositions, I don't think any of you are arguing with me here, but the 3D shape is critical for a lot of chemistry. Um, and it really needs to be included, especially in sort of protein ligand binding. Um, and that's some of what I'll be talking about today. So just to examine this, uh, let's talk about how difficult it is to put molecules um, into a computer. What's the easiest way of describing a molecule? Well, maybe some of you might think the easiest thing is to write down the formula. So if you can see my mouse, if you look at the formula of ethanol down here, that's possibly easier than putting in the 3D coordinates of it. Um, uses less penning, for example. But if we're gonna try and make artificial neural networks, for example, that can solve chemistry problems, it's a really good idea to look at the biological neural networks that are already incredibly good at chemistry, i.e. human beings. Um, and when we examine this, we see that maybe the problem isn't quite what we thought it was. So uh, a six month old human um, has figured out about 3D space and that they live in it. And it takes them a year and a half before they, they show that they understand 2D space. And it takes somewhere between two and four years before they start to deal with one dimensional input, such as speaking or writing. And also at this point, they learn symbols. So going back to the chemistry problem, if we're asking, a, say, a neural network, I, I will move, I will use the word neural network a lot, but a lot of what I say here applies to machine learning, by the way. But if we have a neural network and we give it, say, the formula for ethanol, first it has to understand the symbols. What do these letters and numbers mean? Then it has to learn a lot of chemistry to know that this formula here is, is correct in terms of bonds, but not correct in terms of angles. And then finally get a 3D structure. This is a, a lot. <laughs> it's not impossible, but it's a, it's a big ask of a, of a neural network. And perhaps the 3D input is going to make things a lot easier. So how do people input molecules into machine learning algorithms? So there are quite a few 1D inputs, such as fingerprints. There are many different types of these, uh, physical chemical properties, smile strings and smirks. And these are great for the right problems, but not, I think, the 3D ones. Um, there's also 2D inputs based on a 2D formula, such as you draw in a lab book, which is technically called a molecular graph. And there are some 3D inputs. For example, the grid featureizer uh, marks divide space into a series of voxels, like little cubes of volume, and marks which of them have molecules, uh, atoms in. But this leads to very sparse, large data, which is quite hard to learn from. So I, I've, I think there's room for another 3D input in this space. Uh, proposition two, if you can see it, augmentation is necessary. So chemistry data sets are small and they're very small compared to the sort of data sets you'd normally use in machine learning. And that's because chemistry data is hard to get. Someone needs to go into the lab and actually do an experiment or make a new molecule. Um, and a, a, as a comparison, so ImageNet, which is a data set used in machine learning for image recognition, that information came from Flickr. So you had almost everyone in the world taking photos and labeling them to choose from. Whereas with chemistry data, we only have trained chemists. Um, and the other thing is, if you're, you're working in your lab, you'll likely only have a small data set because you have all of the things that have been run by your group in the last half many years. So we really need to get the most out of these small data sets. So how do we do that? Well, in machine learning, we use something called augmentation. 
And this is a method of effectively increasing the number of um, data that you have. So for example, if you look at a picture of the cat in the top corner, left corner, you can uh, take a mirror, mirror flip of that picture and you get a second picture of a cat. This can then be learned from as a second data point. Now it's not quite as good as putting in a second picture of a different cat, but it does help um, neural networks learn the essential cattishness of this. So for example, a cat has furry ears, it has paws, and not, you know, we want it to learn those uh, sort of global features between those rather than pay attention to like the pixels, the eye are blue. So we don't want it to identify that as the important feature and not the general cattishness. <laughs> But when we do that with chemistry, we have to think a bit. So a lot of machine learning algorithms might apply this already. Um, so under the hood, so you do have to be careful because obviously if we flip molecules, then we are equating chiral anatomies and that's obviously not very good. And also we need to preserve rotational symmetry. Um, you don't tend to rotate pictures by 180 degrees as augmentation if you're doing uh, machine learning on images, but you can do that in chemistry, it's, it's entirely fine. Okay, so the projects I'm going to present today are IcoStar, which I've talked about before, um, which is a, a method of inputting rotationally invariant descriptions of molecules, and some topological features, and I'm combining that into this thing called IcoSphere. And the aim here is to build sort of a suite of modules that can try and, and it would be useful for these sorts of problems that you could use together. Okay. Protein binding problem. Now, I am certain that pretty much everyone else in this talk knows more about the protein binding problem than me. So I, I'm, I'm approaching this from more the data end. Um, and this is this is what how I'm doing the problem. So we have the PD bind core data set. This is a small data set, and crucially, it's about the size of a data set I'd imagine a lab might have, or a pharmaceutical company might have if they were trying some ligands on a certain protein. Uh, target. And it's, it's quite a good set data set in that it has a bad, medium and good ligand for each protein, but it is incredibly small. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to train my algorithms on this core data set, this very small data set, and then test it on the core data set, but also on the refined data set, which is a much bigger data set. <laughs> this is not normal. People tend, tend to do this. And the, the reason I'm doing this is to see how much we can get from the core data set. Because um, what we really want to do is, is not solve PDB bind um, and beat the state of the art by a bit. What we actually want to do is come up with some algorithms that are good at getting the most out of a small data set and then can be applied to new data. So it's generalization, brand new data. And we're using the refined data set to sort of model the brand new data. Okay. So, um, yes, I've got backronyms here. Uh, I can't even remember what they stand for. So this is just the IcoStar project. Um, so the first way to think about these sorts of problems is to think about it at different levels of abstraction. So the least abstract layer level is the atomic positions and properties of those atoms at each point in the binded pocket and for the ligand. Um, if we increase the level of abstraction, we get these sort of ribbon diagrams. Um, and now we don't know where each atom is in the binding pocket, but we do know the rough shape and we know where the protein um, backbone is. Further increasing the abstraction, we get these sort of cartoons uh, where now our binding pocket is this Pac-Man shaped object and our ligand is a triangle. So we know it fits and we might actually pay attention or include um, where hydrogen bonds might form or not form. And then the most abstract is literally just comparing the shape of the binding pocket to the shape of the ligand. And this is where the topological features come in. <clears throat> okay, so the key idea here is we want to use these things called spherical or icosahedral neural networks. And these are good at dealing with uh, spherical or icosahedron inputs. And that allows us to input three dimensional data of a molecule. Um, and train on it. So what we want to do is, is figure out uh, sort of which 
So what we want to do is we then project the model molecule onto a box. I'll, I'll explain what that means in a minute. But um, first I want to talk about icosahedrons. So if you have a sphere, so you have a 3D object, it's a sphere, it's a globe, um, and you want to make a 2D version of it, so you want to unfold it somehow. Now, if you try, if you look at the pictures at the bottom, you see these two methods of unfolding a three-dimensional curved object. Um, they're not very good because they distort the size of the continents, uh, both of them. And actually, the, the shape that gives the smallest distortion when going from 3D to 2D is an icosahedron, as you'll see on the, the right here. So we've, project, we've got a globe um, projected onto an icosahedron, and then we've unfolded it. And you'll see that the continents are the same, the right size and shape compared to what you'd see on the globe. And you'll see where augmentation comes in here because there are two separate unfoldings that look different. So they're different in pixel space, but contain the same information. Okay, so how, how do we use this in chemistry? So what we do is we take a molecule, a uh, cubane here, and we encapsulate it into an icosahedron. We then project the atoms from the center of mass, which is at the center of our icosahedron, to the surface. So you can think of a light bulb at the center of your molecular structure, and you turn it on, and the atoms cast a shadow on the surface of the icosahedron. And then you color in the triangular faces of the icosahedron um, by which atom has uh, cast a shadow on it and then you unfold it. So this is the sort of thing you get. So these uh, nets, they're called. Um, and you see some interesting features here. So you get some repeated sort of shapes like this sort of uh, four triangle shape there and the two top ones. And you get some nets that, um, you know, the, these two, one can be rotated onto the other. So, so these sorts of diagrams are capturing the the symmetry and the shape and the properties of the molecule in, in an interesting way. So here's another example, this is benzene. Same thing, we put it into the icosahedron, we project onto the edge, we color it in and then we unfold it. And you see you can have lots of different um, unfoldings, nets here, and you see the same sort of thing, a couple of repeated patterns, some, uh, some that are exactly the same, which we expect because Benzene has a high degree of rotational symmetry, so that's not surprising. Uh, and does it pay attention to chirality? Um, and the answer is it does. So here are two chiral enantiomers. Um, if you look at the one on the right hand side, um, and you the black uh, triangle there is carbon, you'll see that the fluorine is two triangles away from carbon on that surface. And if you compare it to the enantiomer on the left, you'll see that to go from fluorine to carbon, there isn't a two triangle group. So these can't be overlapped, which has separated the, uh, that has, that doesn't mean you can tell the difference between the chiral enantiomers. Okay. Now, I hope it was uh, perhaps obvious. Um, obviously we're not using uh, icosahedrons because that's only 20 triangular pixels. That's quite small. So what we do is we, we use icospheres. And for these, you basically divide the triangular faces up into more triangles and project them out to make a, a circle. And you can do this many, many times, it's sort of fractal and have as many triangles as you want. Um, and on the right hand side here, um, sorry, uh, we have a couple of, okay, let me explain what these are, sorry. Um, what's going on here is we have a molecule that is rotating inside uh, various levels of icosphere. Now that molecule is Tamiflu, which tells you exactly when I did this. Um, and if, and as it rotates, we're coloring the surface on the basis of which atom has hit it. And incidentally, I'm using teal here for hydrogens. And then we are unfolding it exactly the same way. And for each degree of rotation, that's one frame of the movie. So what you see you see these interesting patterns moving across the surface there, and that encodes some of the, well, it encodes the, the, the relative angles and the shape and the distances of the atoms. And you see some patterns. If you have a look at the orange uh, triangles, which is obviously sulfur, you'll see it moves in an interesting looping way that is indicative of where it is in the molecule. 
you also see that the carbons tend to travel with hydrogens, which again, is something we'd expect. So in this work, I'm not using the movies, but I use the individual frames of the movies, which is basically looking at the same molecule from different angles. Okay. Now I mentioned earlier that symbols were quite hard for neural networks. Um, so I declared war on symbols in this work. So there are no symbols. Um, and instead I encode the atoms on the basis of their atomic mass. So we're using nature symbols. And this gives um, a little bit of information uh, that's useful. It obviously tells you that carbon is heavier than the hydrogen and you know, it, it yeah, avoids the specific use of symbols. Okay, um, so uh, let's take this program, IcoStar and apply it to PDB bind. So just to remind you what the task is, we take the core data set and because we're using some of it for validation and test sets, this is now very tiny, it's 155 complexes. We test it on the core data set. And then once we've trained to the neural network, test it on the core data set, we then do a generalization test on the refined data set, which is the much bigger data set. Uh, the setup is, is like this. We have um, our structures, the protein binder pocket here, into an icosahedral net that goes into a spherical icosahedral neural network. Same with the ligand, they're combined um, and it's a neural network. Okay, so this is what we get. Um, so, right, first thing to point out, the state of the art is this line here. So this is what the other algorithms that have worked on this particular data set um, have gotten. So first point, so the left hand side is the results from a single net. And then we move to the middle set of columns, that's 60 nets. So that's where we've added an augmentation. Um, that's just rotational augmentation. And you'll see that the test um, results have actually gotten much better from towards the state of the art. Um, and on the right hand side, I've added rotations and also conformers because you know, it's quite easy to, you can put in one conformer, many rotations, you can put in different conformers, etc. So, So we did that and that has also worked. But what's really interesting here is that in each three cases, it is also able to generalize to the larger data set. So the neural network has managed to learn well enough on this very small data set that it's given good answers, sort of the same level of accuracy um, as it got on the test data that it was using. So this is great. And it doesn't take that long either. So this is, this is awesome, I'm quite happy about that. Um, the other thing about this approach um, is it trains very quickly. There's an idea in sort of machine learning about one-shot learning being uh, a very good thing and something you want to move towards. Um, and this approach requires, so one-shot learning would be a single epoch. The, the machine learning algorithm learns from seeing each example only once. Um, this algorithm isn't quite at that level, but as you'll see, after only one epoch, um, the errors are actually not that far from what you need after final training. And it doesn't take that many epochs to train this data. So it's quite fast. And that is a result of the huge amount of augmentation we've added in. Okay, uh, topological features. So I know that topology and topological features have come up in proteins and protein binding before. Um, so I won't spend too much on this, but um, I'll just go through a little bit of, of basic topology. So luckily I've had lunch, so I'm not too hungry. Um, so topology, I, I view it as the maths of squashy things. Um, and it's, rela it's related to sort of counting the style of the type of shape, how many holes in it. So for example, a donut is not equal to a bread roll because a donut has a hole in it. And a donut is not equal or well, the same thing really this means as a pretzel because the pretzel has two holes and the donut has one. But what's less obvious perhaps is that a donut is the same type of thing as a teacup. Now to, fit, to understand this, imagine if you made a donut out of Play-Doh and then set yourself the task that without adding more holes or breaking it, can you reshape that, that donut into a teacup shape? 
and I think you'll find you can. And this is the sort of questions that topology deals with. Um, so what we're going to look at, these things called persistence diagrams. Uh, what these do is they count things like the number of connected components, so sort of the blobs. And the way it happens is you have your points in space and then you expand uh, a ball around them, as you'll see now. And what happens is when they join, like here, that's a new connected component. And then when that one joins that, it then dies. So this graph that looks quite, you know, dark, you know, birth versus death, the, the birth is when the points join to make a new connected component and death is when they end, such so as there. That's when these two points join. And this gives you information about the shape. Right, so how do we use this for proteins? So as I suggested, the, um, the abstraction of this problem. So we had the least abstract here with the positions and the properties and I could start around here. Um, so the topological features are here. We only have sort of the gross shape features. So one way to describe it is that persistence diagrams can be thought of as reverse mass spectroscopy for shape. So in mass spectroscopy, you have your molecule, smash it into pieces, you look at the pieces and you figure out what you had. Uh, with this, you have the points of the molecule and you merge them and you look at how that works to figure out what you had. It's very similar sort of but reverse sort of thing. So I'll give you an example of how this works. So here is a protein binding pocket. We keep the points where all the atoms are we throw away all the information associated with those points. So what atom they are, how heavy they are, anything like that. And we end up with a point cloud, which you see down here on the left. Do what we did before, we expand around the blobs and then count. We can count the connected parts, um, the loops. These are the sort of 2D circular holes and the voids. These are slightly more complex sort of 3D holes. Um, and what we get with the protein um, so it does actually pick up some chemical information because obviously it has points and how far away they are. So the first two points to merge do tend to be atoms that are bonded to each other. So this is related to bonds. H1 is the loop. So these things here are the aromatic rings that you can see there. And the final thing is the whole thing merges into a single blob is the destruction of the binding pocket, which is a loop in this thing because it's quite flat. We can do the same thing with the ligand. Um, this is uh, the ligand that goes in that um, protein binding pocket. Um, and it's the same sort of thing. And it even includes things that chemists wouldn't necessarily uh, pay attention to, such as this void here. You know, it, that is this point here. But the point is that you could look at these uh, persistence diagrams and figure out from the shape, hopefully, whether the ligand would fit into the binding pocket and there's a lot of information in here so what do we do so we take our 3d structure we make a point cloud we make these quick diagrams and we do some matrix maths and we end up with some topological features now uh, that's what these features are here you don't really need to know exactly what they are they are largely well number of points is, is quite obvious if you um, the others are distances they're to do their measurements to do with distances between points and for the experiment I'm going to show you, we take either six dimensions, so that's persistence entropy, x, y, z for ligand and protein, or 36 dimensions, that's all of them, and we train. And we're using a really simple neural network here, just feed forward to hidden layer. Um, it's the sort of thing, less number of units that people were using in sort of the 90s. So it's very, very, it's not deep learning or anything like that. And what do we find? So the topological features, um, when you have all of the input features, it equals the state of the art. So to make the point here, this is, it's, it's, it's um, sort of thin data. <laughs> so we've got as many points, we've got 155 points for training on, um, but for each point, we're only putting in 36 numbers. So that's 36 input features. And this is obviously capturing enough of the shape that it's able to solve the problem. Now there's a lot of variance there, as you'll see, but it, you know, it can do it. Okay, so chicken soup and PDB binds. So <laughs> I decided to combine these two things into a single algorithm. Um, 
which you could call a kitchen sink algorithm, you know, everything and the kitchen sink. But uh, I wanted to put together things that should be there rather than everything that we could find, hence chicken soup. Um, yeah. So going back to the, this picture again, um, ICO stars around here. It's slightly more abstract than putting in all of the points. Um, and the topological features are here. So we've got both the least and most abstract representation of the problem. And these are complementary. So the icospherical projection method from Icostar, this is scale free, it's rotationally invariant 3D structure. It includes the atom masses, which tells the program about the types, um, includes like relative angles and things like that. With the conformers, it includes flexibility. And then we have the topological features and this has very little chemistry in it and includes the scale of the chunks so that this actually has distances in it, um, has the 3D shape and points out where there are chunks, holes and voids and tunnels, which are exactly what they sound like. Um, and then I put in a couple of chemical features. Uh, these are things that are very easy to measure from RD kits, so really simple things like uh, moments of inertia and atomic mass, uh, sorry, molecular mass, stuff like that. Okay, so how does this work, these different algorithms? Now I'm sure the very first thing you'll notice is this column here, which I know looks horrendous. So for this one, there was a big outlier. Um, and that kind of happens with machine learning. Sometimes it just, the algorithm just goes off in a completely different direction and, and finds some very strange answers, which is obviously why you do validation, you do test sets before you deploy your algorithm. Um, and this can be fixed, obviously, by playing around with the hyperparameters and tuning it for the problem, but I left the outlier in for this. Okay, first thing to note, um, on the test sets, that's the red bars, all of these methods um, equal the state they are. So this is great. So we, we can solve the problem based on just the icospherical input, which shows that this method works. We can solve it, I showed you earlier, with just the topological features. Well, there's much wider error bars on that. Um, so that, that works and we can combine them. So the neural networks are capable of solving this problem. The other thing to note, which is very exciting, is that uh, in pretty much all cases, I do need to rerun that one, um, the, all of the algorithm approaches gen can generalize to the larger data set with about the same accuracy. So this, this is really cool. Um, if you're looking to see if there's a pattern in the size of the bars, uh, they're not just, you know, they're not significantly different. So the point is that they're all able to solve the problem and all at the level of the state of the art. This does suggest that with this particular data set, um, the, the error of about 1.9 kilocalories per mole is actually the most you can get from that data set with that information. Okay. Um, so if you're interested in showing whether your method works or which method works best, you're obviously interested in the means, but if you're interested in actually just building an algorithm that you can use, you actually care about sort of the minimum values that you can get, so the, the best um, uh, algorithm, the smallest error that you can find, because obviously if you're going to deploy it to, you know, in your lab, you don't really mind if you train, train 10 algorithms, throw away eight of them and just take the two best ones, for example. So we see here, we've got some nice results here. Um, quite simple, yeah, um, quite small neural networks up here. We get some very good te uh, values on the test data set. Slightly larger neural networks over here, we get that's the best one we got. So that's the, the best error on the uh, generalization data set. So it all looks pretty cool. Okay, conclusion. So as I pointed out, the data set I'm looking at is obviously missing something if, it's, uh, if, if we want to improve the, um, the error on it. However, it has shown that all of the methods actually do work and are able to get um, a lot out of the data set. Um, I've shown that augmentation does improve generalization and, and the point that I'm sure you already all agree with me that shape is important and I've demonstrated two different ways of putting that in 
to a neural network. Now some of the advantages, uh, IcoStar is able to hit the state of the art with less training time. So it is quite easy to avoid overtraining then. You can literally stop after two or five epochs and you've got a pretty good answer. So it hasn't had the time to overtrain. Um, training on this very small data set um, and we're able to generalize to a much larger, messier data set. So this is awesome. If you go back to your lab and you've got like 50 molecules that you've run against a protein or whatever, or yeah, 150 molecules, say, uh, then you could train on that and perhaps get something useful um, to predict uh, on what to work on next. Um, I, I think it's interesting that so that such small topological features equals the state of the art, which means that this problem is being solved using very much just the shape information rather than that much of sort of the chemistry. Um, I'm not going to say that it's completely not chemistry because there is ways that the chemical data is getting into these descriptions, but it seems that shape seems to be the most important thing here. Um, and since I have a bit of time, the, the future work. So a couple of things I want to do. I want to look at other data sets that are very small, but also in the same area. Um, but I'm also planning to build this. So as I showed these earlier, these little, you know, disco um, dance floors, I've heard people call them. Um, thinking of putting these into a neural network as sequence data. So that would be putting the video in, in some format. And I think that would be quite useful. Okay, that's the end of my talk. So feel free to ask questions. Thank you.